Conductors, mechanics, and brakemen are passionately proud of their trains. They are railway men. The railroad is their life. All aboard! It's been over 160 years since the first train arrived in Canada. During that time, thousands of workers helped write the saga of these powerful machines. Today's locomotives are very different from their steam-powered ancestors who ruled when working for the railroad was considered an honor and a privilege. They lifted shovels full of coal with the care usually reserved for precious metals. Sleeves rolled up, uniforms stained with grease and sweat. They fed, cosseted, and polished their machines. Man and machine became one. They had their own language. 6532, no signals. One wears the uniform of a conductor. And another sports the telegraph operator's visor. Simple baggage handlers are the one giving orders. They are all proud to be part of the railroad. Canyon. It's a vocation. There is a fire in the belly of a railway man that never goes out. We weren't pretentious, engineers, conductors, but we were proud to say we were railway men. It was a tough job, and I loved it. The tougher, the harder it was, the more I loved it. I grew up on the trains. I started at 16. I loved it. I loved my life. Until the first half of the 20th century, railway men were a special group. At the time, the railroad was Canada's number one industry. Better paid than most workers, these specialized employees occupied a different social rank. They were envied, respected, and admired. If you were a locomotive engineer, if you were a railway conductor, a train conductor, you were the cream of the crop. I mean, you had, think about it for a minute. You control a locomotive, a steam locomotive that maybe has about, depending on the era, 1,000, 2,000, 300 horsepower at a time when other people just control plain old horses. Um, you are responsible for an entire train. Uh, this train goes to exotic locations. You may be working class, but in fact you're something else. You're what you call the aristocrats of labor. You're, you're perceived as somebody incredibly important. Every young person aspires at that time to these kinds of jobs. The status is amazing. In the heyday of steam, one man, one job, attracted the greatest amount of attention. When a locomotive rumbled through a village trailing its cloud of white smoke, people stopped what they were doing in the hope of seeing the engineer bring the train to a halt. A seasoned engineer could bring the train to a standstill as the last puff of smoke rose from the stack. Such skill and grace were earned through years of experience. Of all the traveling workers, the engineer was king. He's responsible for controlling the speed, uh, the brakes, uh, the pressure in the boiler, um, He's the one that has to watch the signals and obey them uh, as to speeds. He has a whole 
uh, timetable that he has to follow at the same time, he has to be aware of, he has to understand um, uh, where there are problems with the tracks ahead, where, for which he receives orders, special orders, uh, which tell him uh, there's a, a weak spot or a slow order along the line, slow down from milepost uh, X to milepost Y. Um, and then he has to listen to whatever orders are sent to him uh, through the train line system by the railway conductor who tells him to proceed or to stop at a station. Uh, so all this is his responsibility and he's, he does all this, this kind of work. He also barks the orders to the fireman who has to feed the fire. Becoming an engineer was not for everyone. The work was demanding, requiring a great deal of concentration. The engineer was at the head of a convoy of boxcars filled with cargo. Trains of that size can't stop on a dime. With passenger trains, the engineer held the comfort and safety of hundreds of passengers in the palms of his hands. He was well aware of his responsibilities. One false move was enough to damage his reputation. Real cracker jacks, you know, and other ones were so-so. It's like, it's like in, every, in every trade or whatever you have. But the good ones, you could tell the good ones because they had pride in what they were doing, you know. They had a, a sense of pride and a sense of responsibility, especially if you're working on a passenger train, you know, and you're handling the brake and you have people in their cars eating lunch or sleeping in the sleepers at night. To give them a nice smooth ride. Some other engineers, you know, they were they were good, but they weren't so smooth. The engineer never left his seat while the train was moving. The stoker did the heavy lifting. During the steam era, he had the unenviable job of feeding the boiler. Together, stoker and engineer formed an inseparable team. Together, they pushed their machine to the limits. If the engineer feels that he's not getting enough power out of his engine, then he'll get, he'll bark uh, firmer orders to the fireman saying, come on, shovel faster, shovel harder. I want, uh, I want more coal in the right, I want more coal in the left, I want more in the middle, I want it to spread out more. And these kinds of orders, and the fireman has to just make do. The stoker was an apprentice engineer. Occupying the seat on the left, he learned the art of driving a train from his colleague. In a few years, if all went well, he would move to the seat on the right. Then it would be his turn to rule the rails. The stoker had to keep his nose to the grindstone if he wanted to earn his stripes. To do that, he had to shovel. It was a hard job, especially before the appearance of systems that automatically fed coal to the engine. Bent over in front of the boiler, face red with heat, he kept the fire burning by shoveling at a regular pace. Between shovelfuls, he would lift his head to glance at the roads ahead and check the falling engine pressure as the engineer pushed the locomotive. 130 shovelfuls made up about one ton of coal. During a 12-hour trip, the stoker could easily feed the engine between eight to 10 tons of coal. He's the one that has to shovel, shovel, shovel. So the coal's in the tender behind the steam locomotive, and he has to build up the fire uh, in provision for whatever track conditions come ahead. If they're going to be, for example, if you're going to hit some grades, some, some steep grades, he has to build the fire up in advance to ensure there's enough boiler pressure so the locomotive has the power to carry those 50 or 100 freight cars over the hill uh, without stalling. I'm making the engine go. The engineer is driving, running it, but I'm making it go. Without me, it don't go. Without me shoveling the coal, it don't go. Turning coal into steam was an art. Success was judged by the color of the smoke. A good stoker could maintain white-hot coals that produced a pale-colored smoke. As the fire began to die, it became red, burned inefficiently, resulting in black smoke, a sure sign that the locomotive was losing power. Tied to his boiler, nothing could distract the stoker. We were hot on one side and freezing cold on the other. The snow and rain came in the open window. It, it was tough. 
The need for skilled people capable of mastering the new technology was recognized as soon as the first trains began to roll in the middle of the 19th century. The train gave birth to an industry that spawned an incredible number of trades and professions. Schools didn't teach the skills needed on the railroads. They were learned on the job. With each passing kilometer as the locomotive hugged the curves of the tracks, engineers and stokers learned the basics. They studied their engine, absorbing its character, knowledge they would share with the generations of railway men that followed. My father started in 1940 following in the footsteps of his father, my grandfather Napoleon. He worked for 40 years on Le Petit Train du Nord Railroad. I worked alongside him as a brakeman for five years. They were the best years of my career. The railroad was in our blood. Being a railway man was serious business. The railway companies had a reputation for being uncompromising. Lateness and accidents meant astronomical losses for the companies. For a long time, they ruled the railways with an iron discipline. Every action was regulated like clockwork. The employees had to synchronize their watches. On the flight deck of airplanes, in bridges of frigates, and even Canadian Armed Forces submarines, the commander and his number two relayed their orders out loud. Their subordinates then repeat the orders out loud. This procedure originated with the railroads. Like the captain of a ship, the engineer was the central figure in these exchanges. He read the signals, checked the orders, and never took his eyes off the road. He often had to shout to be heard over the deafening roar of the locomotive. To run trains, you have something that's uh, running over extremely difficult conditions, uh, different changing uh, climatic conditions, changing social and economic conditions. Uh, there's also the safety issue. Uh, it doesn't. It is a, to no one's advantage to have a locomotive or a train pile up with hundreds of deaths and all kinds of equipment uh, smashed. So very quickly, um, safety rules are developed. Uh, it takes a while. It takes a few accidents for railways to understand this principle. Uh, but very, very quickly, um, the safety issue becomes very, very important, far earlier than in any other industry. And uh, so what happens is railways develop the, the uniform code of rules, the little booklets like this. This little red book contained all the rules and regulations governing the railways. It was a must-have. Like a catechism or the multiplication tables, employees had to know it by heart. Signals, procedures, safety regulations, everything was covered. A good employee was never without his uniform code of operating rules. It's a Bible. It's like a Bible. Everything is in here. Superior of train, train order, spring switch, everything in here is important. And you cannot, you cannot work on the rear road unless you have this book. This, you must have this book. You can't have it, got to have it in your pocket, but you must have it in your bag when you go to work. And you must work by these rules. Life with the railroad was highly regimented. To the railway companies, their image was paramount and those in charge imposed a strict code of conduct on their employees to ensure an untarnished image. Fighting, insubordination, and the consumption of alcohol were forbidden. The railway companies had a paternalistic attitude towards their employees, who they often treated as military recruits. Nothing could stand in the way of the safety and smooth running of the railway. An employee found responsible for an accident paid a high price. He was immediately fired. Beyond strict self-discipline and the ability to memorize mountains of rules and regulations, 
a railway man had to have a good ear. The expression, the train will whistle three times, remains an indelible part of railway history. The train whistle, a romantic symbol from the glory days of steam, has long inspired filmmakers and writers. For many years, the whistle of a passing train was part of daily life in towns and villages throughout the country. Today, there are fewer boxcar convoys, but these behemoths still signal their arrival in town or at a level crossing with the whistle. Long before two-way radios, the conductor used the whistle to communicate with the engineer isolated in his locomotive. Six short blows and the stoker knew the passengers were cold and he had to turn up the heat in the cars. With the arrival of diesel, the locomotive lost its musicality. New communication technologies reduced reliance on the whistle, almost silencing it. Listen to the whistle on a steam locomotive and listen to a diesel. There's a huge difference. It wasn't only the whistles that changed. With the modern railroad's computerized consoles, orders and all other information reached its destination in record time. The railway companies were constantly looking for more efficient ways to communicate with their moving trains. For nearly a century, the communication system rested in the hands of four types of employee. First, there was the dispatcher. He managed the traffic along the tracks. He decided where the trains could pass each other safely and where one would have to pull over and wait. There were no panels with flashing lights or sophisticated tracking systems to aid in the task. He was under enormous pressure. The telegraph operator helped the dispatcher in his delicate maneuvering. In rural areas, he was also the station master and kept order. Sitting at his machine, he transmitted orders to proceed or stop to the station nearest the train. Between stations, the engineer was out of contact. The telegraph operator became the eyes and ears of the system. On board the train, the conductor acted as messenger, receiving orders from the telegraph operator and transmitting them to the engineer. The orders were issued on paper in several copies. The transmission from station to moving train was accomplished using this simple stick fitted with a metal loop. For years, vital information was passed along this fragile link. Equipped with only a rudimentary system of communication and tools they often made themselves, these four men worked in perfect synchronicity, performing their duties with up-to-the-minute accuracy. Time ruled the railways. In the days of the steam locomotives, all operations depended on the reliability of a single precision tool, the simple pocket watch. For railway men, this famous watch was more than a symbol of a bygone era. I got this in 1943, used it for 32, 33 years, until they installed battery-powered clocks, but they never matched this. Steam locomotives were not equipped with speedometers. The engineer was able to gauge his speed using his watch. He timed how long it took the train to travel the distance between two speed indicators placed one and a half kilometers apart. We could gauge our speed with the watch. If you wanted to know how fast you were going, you counted the minutes and the seconds. Today we talk about miles per hour. This watch was our life, our speedometer. We had to get the correct time. 
Je le connais hier, juste. There are two pages in the code book uh, merely on watches. Just watches, railway watches, the importance of watches, how watches have to be kept on time, have to be kept oiled, have to be kept maintained. The company has a location all, acro all across, uh, locations all across Canada for adjusting timepieces, checking them and so on. Uh, conductors are, are asked to check the time of the station agent all the time. There's two whole pages just on watches. Railway workers led a regulated life, but it wasn't an easy one. The trains ruled by time pushed the employees. Tight schedules and long hours made it exhausting work. Some jobs carried an additional element of danger. Among the most perilous occupations was that of brakemen. Many were killed in the line of duty. Stopping a locomotive roaring down the narrow tracks under full steam was not easy. The automatic braking systems on modern locomotives greatly improved working conditions for the brakeman. His was one of the riskiest jobs on the railway. The train brakeman is the person who has to always check the brake systems, the switches on the outside for the tracks and so on. It's, um, it's a job that involves um, being subordinate to a conductor, a railway conductor. He basically does all the work on the train that needs to be done. Um, but when there's outdoors work that comes, then he's the one that has to go outside. If there's a mechanical breakdown, he's the one that goes outside and checks between the cars, under the car, uh, what the problem is. A brakeman would have made an excellent train robber, or better still, a stuntman in a Hollywood Western. While the train was still moving, he jumped off, ran along the tracks ahead of the train to reach the switching point. After working the switch, he hopped back on the train, climbed to the roof of the boxcars, where, exposed to the elements, he pulled the brake by hand. We would climb up like this, and once up, we would cross over here. The arrival of pneumatic brakes made this last move unnecessary, except in marshalling yards, where the brakeman still displays his prowess. The installation of shock absorbers on the train did more than increase passenger comfort. This innovation solved a mechanical problem common in the days of steam. On rough terrain, the pulling of the locomotive combined with changes in speed stressed and often broke the couplings between boxcars. Changing this piece was a dangerous job. Alors, le jeu on appelait ça, nous, un knuckle. We call this the knuckle. It was a joint. And when it broke, the whole thing had to be replaced. We had to open it. And that was very dangerous. Even walking along the marshalling yard while a wagon is released down the track to couple with another train was very dangerous because it was silent. Puis euh, le roulement d'un wagon euh, qui va de son, de sa, son, son propre, sa propre allure, c'est silencieux, euh, ça peut être silencieux, puis on ne l'entend pas venir. Souvent aussi dans des jeux d'attelage, il y en a qui sont fait coincer dans des jeux d'attelage. C'est un petit peu macabre de parler de ça, mais c'est ce qui arrivait. Euh, moi, j'ai... J'ai lost 10 of my colleagues this way. Dix confrères qui ont perdu leur vie au chemin de fer. 
Brakeman and other employees occupying more junior positions often waited years for the promotion that would increase their salaries and improve their quality of lives. Seniority was sacred on the railroad and the only route to promotion. Silent films exploited images of damage and destruction of the early rail era. Behind these humorous scenes lurked a sometimes tragic reality. Life on the railroad was sometimes ruthless. With the risks of the job came the hazards of the road, tragedies that even the best engineers couldn't avoid. Many railway workers live with the image of their massive machines roaring through a level crossing, unable to stop in time to avert a tragedy. She was getting married soon. She was working at Sicard at saint Thérèse. Her boyfriend told her the day before he couldn't marry her because he was already married and had two kids. She was on the tracks with a strange look. I kept whistling to startle her, couldn't do anything. I stopped the train, but it was 300 feet too late. The trains rolled day and night. Employees sometimes worked seven days a week, leaving behind their wives and children. They created makeshift families in the barracks and houses built for them along the tracks. There they shared meals, sleeping quarters, and friendship. You didn't have your own room. You'd be two or three in a place. And the old engineer would be snorting and Jesus, wake up in the morning and you're more tired than when you went to bed, you know? But that uh, was part of it, so that was, uh, was the fun of it, you know? The last wagon on the train didn't look like much. It was the caboose. Its approach signaled the end of the boxcar convoy. Caboose comes from the German word caboose, which means the place where the kitchen is on a boat. These modest cars were home to the conductor and brakeman. They retired here after a day of back-breaking work. We came in here. There were three mattresses piled up. We opened the benches and put the mattress down on them. Sometimes they were frozen, and we would stand them up over there. And while the train was moving, they warmed up and became more comfortable. Often, the men had little more than small coal stoves to keep them warm. Happily, improved conditions would raise the morale of the troops. This model is equipped with a toilet, a luxury. In my time, we didn't always have that. It was only after years of hard labor on the freight trains that workers would move onto the passenger routes. The hours were more regular, and the conditions certainly more comfortable. In a world designed for the pleasure of the passengers, everyone had a role to play. At the bottom of the hierarchy was the porter. This job would be the only way for the black community to work for the railroads.
all aboard. Nothing conjures up the golden era of train travel better than these two words. Uttering the words was a privilege reserved for the conductor. Dressed in his uniform, sporting two rows of gold buttons, the conductor swung onto the train as it began to pull away from the platform. His day had begun. His mission? Take the travelers to their destination and ensure that the trip runs smoothly. After years of working on the freight trains in grease-stained uniforms, being promoted to passenger service was the end of a long, hard journey. The job of brakeman often opened the door to being an onboard agent. A blazer with three gold buttons came with the promotion. This was a stepping stone to the coveted uniform of the conductor. If the engineer was the master of the locomotive, the conductor ruled the rest of the train. All the employees reported to him. On your right, throttle. 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 Thank you. Where are you going to? Throttle. The conductor was often the first contact passengers had with railway employees. An authority figure, he was the railway company's representative. He was required to carry out his duties with class and a touch of panache. If a passenger didn't have a ticket, the conductor would have to write one out. They managed to write legibly by moving with the train. Today, people hang on when they ride the subway. On the trains, we didn't. You needed a good sense of balance. Most of the time, you're always like this. You get off the train and you're still like that. <laughs> the chef was also very popular with the passengers. In his constantly moving kitchen, he did his best to meet the expectations of a diverse clientele. I like meeting new people, and in this job you meet a lot of people from all over the world, and uh, they always have interesting stories, and they've been on different trains, and lot, I've had lots of compliments saying that we have some of the best food in the world on VIA, and, I, one time I was going to Toronto and this couple, they got married. I cooked them this meal and they really loved it. And then I was in a Vancouver trip and they were coming back and they were really happy to see me because they went, you're going to take care of us. And that's what we all try to do. In the early part of the 20th century, the golden age of train travel, the dining car was the center of attention. Decorated with the finest fabrics and furniture, it rivaled the trendiest restaurants. A staff that included pantry attendants, waiters and cooks worked to satisfy the most discriminating palates. The dining car featured elaborate menus served on fine porcelain. Today, crystal goblets and elegant silverware are more likely to be found in the baggage car than in the dining car. But the railway companies have retained some traditions that date back to the earliest transcontinental trains. On certain runs, the menu still features regional specialties. On the railroad, one group of workers occupied the lowest rung of the social ladder for a long time the porters. At the beck and call of a demanding clientele, they greeted all requests with a cheerful smile. During the 19th century, by working as porters, members of the black community earned good wages and gained a foothold in the railway industry. In 1867, an American company, Pullman Palace Car, was the first to hire black workers. They were eligible only for the position of sleeping porter. Canadian companies didn't lag far behind. By the mid-30s, one quarter of the black porters in the country came from the United States. The 
jobs are almost guaranteed for that community, but don't try to go beyond those jobs. There's a glass ceiling that you hit, and you just can't get beyond that. A porter's job was to keep the sleeping cars in order and to see to the needs of the passengers. His day was a series of minute details, like shining a pair of shoes. Once gleaming, he put them in the bins next to the compartments. The service had to be impeccable. A single mistake, no matter how small, could tarnish the reputation of the porter and the railway company. Sometimes porters were on duty 24 hours a day, but the most difficult part of their job was enduring the condescension and mistrust directed towards them. They were under a microscope. They could have a brief conversation with men, but interaction with women had to be kept to a minimum. In spite of the obstacles, the railroad was an excellent job opportunity for many porters. There's a, a negative way of looking at it and a positive way of looking at it. The negative way is that there are limits, these, these glass ceilings, these closed barriers. Um, they can be nasty. They can be, you know, they can, they, they can block your progress. On the other hand, at the time, it's seen as a means of social progress. Uh, blacks, for example, would never have been employed, <laughs> would never have been given any kind of guaranteed outlet in the economy if it weren't for the railways. Um, blacks themselves saw this as a phenomenal way of acquiring labor uh, security, of acquiring guaranteed jobs, of acquiring steady income through the whale industry. It took a lengthy legal and political battle before the inequities were addressed. It wasn't until 1960 that positions other than Porter were open to blacks on Canadian railroads. Trains were a man's world, and in an odd way, a family business. A job with the railroad meant prosperity, and the jobs were jealously guarded. They were kept in families, and the torch was passed from one generation to the next. Advances in technology and an ever-diminishing clientele would change that and put thousands of breadwinners out of work. During the 1930s, the railway industry was still flourishing. One employee in 20 worked for the railroad. Working conditions were good. It was respectable. The working class valued a job like that. Even better if it stayed in the family. It wasn't unusual for three, four, or five generations of the family to work for the railroad. In fact, the companies encouraged it. They felt this ensured a loyal, devoted workforce. In my time, everyone who worked for the railroad had an uncle or a father or a brother who worked there. It was family. My grandfather worked for the railroad, as did my father, then me, and now my son is a conductor. The railroad had an enormous impact on the growth of unions. The Union of Railway Workers was among the first in Canada. Today, the engineers are represented by the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers. Founded in 1863, it's the oldest union in North America. For over a century, the railways endured at least one strike every decade. They were usually short, lasting on average 10 days. It was 1987, 88. Other unions had gone on strike. We were in negotiations. We thought there might be a breakthrough. The government was convinced we were heading for an impasse. They obtained an injunction. We declared a strike at 11.59 p.m. and we were ordered back to work at 12.01 a.m. Our strike lasted only one minute. For a long time, the railway would remain a boys club. Speed, steam masculine pursuits. During the two world wars, women joined the war effort and the workforce. With thousands of their male employees headed for the battlefields, the railway companies opened their doors to women. They worked as secretaries, and some even operated the telegraph. 
Many entered factories converted to producing tanks instead of locomotives. Times were changing, but the caboose and the locomotive remained male bastions. Gradually, a few intrepid females climbed into the locomotive as engineers. I love driving anything with an engine. I had my own business, and many of my customers worked for the railroad. It made an impression on me. I wanted to find out how to get a job with the railway. My mother knew someone who worked there, and when they were hiring, I applied, took the course, and they hired me. A woman taking the right-hand seat in the locomotive was not the only change on the railroad. The arrival of the automobile, the increased reliance on trucks to transport freight, and the growth of aviation began to squeeze the railways. Jobs were lost along with thousands of kilometers of track. In 1950, when CN was the largest employer in Canada, its workforce numbered 117,000. Today, CN employs fewer than 20,000 people in Canada. As steam gave way to diesel and operations were automated, the ranks of the railway men were decimated. Entire trades disappeared. The telephone operator replaced the telegraph operator. Newfangled watches left the clockmaker with time on his hands. The track inspector and his velocipede and the horticulturalist responsible for the station gardens are now part of history. Diesel power freed the stoker from his heavy burden, rendering him obsolete. As the number of jobs diminished, so did the prestige associated with them. It was alive. Those things were alive. The steam engine is something like it, was, it had a heart. It had a heart. When the engine would run and it would start to to, to blast off there, to bark there. It's like it had a heart. But a diesel locomotive, you just open the throttle and the power is delivered, you know? It's just like, a, it's not the same feeling. You drove the train. You worked with a good engineer and conductor. And when you arrived at the terminus, you could say, I had a good run today. The steam engine, you had the feeling of, you know, Jesus, this is something. And you look out, you know, big long nose in front of you there, and the wind blowing and, you know, waving to the people, to the kids and all that. It was, uh, what can you say, fantastic. Trains will continue to fire our imagination for years to come as they warm the hearts of those who lived on and for the railroad. I loved my work as a brakeman on the passenger trains. I loved it very much. It's different. We work outdoors. That's what I liked. Great life. I miss it very much. I'm retired now, but I miss it very, very much. Mr. Dever died a few months after the interview.